So without further ado, I'll just introduce our speakers today um, that will speak to the Soil Health Initiative, going from a big idea to executing a very large multi-year project. So um, Chris Benedict, he's a um, professor and extension specialist in Whatcom County, and he's the WSU, WSU lead on the Soil Health Initiative. Also is Chad Kruger, and Chad is the director of WSU Treefruit Research and Extension Center and of uh, Center for Sustaining Ag and Natural Resources. So thank you, uh, Chris and Chad, and take it away. Chad, I think he's gonna kick it off. All right, so I'll, I'm gonna give a little bit of background on, on how this came to be, and then Chris will kind of give a lot more in-depth discussion, and I'm actually gonna check out after a few minutes and give this intro, because I am double booked. Um, so um, basically, long story short, there had been a lot of discussions in, in the CSANR advisory committee, which is an external stakeholder committee on the need to advance soil health, soil quality related research and extension to uh, kind of across the board in, in the different production systems of the state. It's, it's one of those things that regardless of what you grow, everybody's been getting more and more interested in this. And so about seven or eight years ago, we actually had a session at an advisory committee meeting where we said, what do we actually need? And, and we distilled that down to, you know, top priorities. And, and for the first couple of years, we tried to use the limited instruments that we had, like the bioag program to encourage more in soil health. Um, but kind of serendipity happened. And there was an opportunity where I was invited to go down and speak at the Results Washington Forum, where Governor Inslee hosts kind of the state agencies have this thing that they do where they're benchmarking all of their work relative to a plan. And Derek Sanderson from the Department of Agriculture brought me down as part of a group responding to one of the things that Department of Agriculture had to respond to. And the governor just kind of blew up the whole thing and said, I don't want to talk about this. I want to talk about soils. And so for about 15 minutes, we went on this rabbit trail on soil health. And the conclusion of it was, you know, we have some ideas, we have some knowledge, but we're missing a lot in terms of just what we know about the state of soils in the state, particularly the agricultural soils, and that we're short on implementation and, and that there were gaps there that could be solved. And at the end of that discussion, he said, well, I'm really interested in soil health. And, you know, kind of all the agency heads in the room went, ah, he's, he's talking, he wants some, some kind of legislative initiative around this. So we got together, we had Department of Ag Conservation Commission leadership come to Pullman and sit down with college leadership on this issue and, and essentially walked through the question of, okay, how could we respond to this? What would it look like? And we did a couple of things. One of those is WSU pulled together a group of people working in the soil space and just kind of, you know, just what are we doing? Um, and then we also decided what we really needed to do is pull together a little bit more robust planning session or summit that involved membership from university, agency, um, NGO, and industry, and kind of really try to put the pieces of a puzzle together of what this thing could look like. If we really wanted to do something big relative to soil health and state, what would it look like? And out of that discussion really was born the, call it the pillars of the soil health initiative, which Chris will talk about in more detail, things like the long-term sites, the, uh, the road mapping process, that kind of thing. The other piece that came clearly out of it is the idea of a three-part agency partnership with WSU being the, the research and extension arm, WSDA being really the, the entity responsible for answering the question, the state of the soils in the state, as well as some coordination with, with kind of the, the agency political side of the process and the conservation commission and, the, and consequently the districts being pulled in as, as a mechanism through which um, funding for implementation and that kind of thing could be put in play. And so we, we 
basically all three of us with, with industry leadership support submitted essentially fiscal notes, fiscal note requests to the legislature. The first time around, it, it, it kind of sort of didn't get a lot of um, enthusiasm behind it in terms of somebody picking up. Part of it was it was in the governor's budget, but it just didn't really have that, that thing that the legislature said, Here, what, am I, what are we funding? And ultimately, one of the state senators picked it up and said, well, let's kick this off. And so they did a proviso for a couple of years just to start us down the pathway on the road mapping process, but also said, start the Mount Vernon long-term site. And then we came back around a second time. And in this case, WSDA actually had sponsored legislation sponsored or agency sponsored legislation. I think it's House Bill 6306 which actually was kind of enabling legislation to make the thing happen, then coupled that with the, the requests from the, the three agencies. And that picked up incredible amount of enthusiasm. And it was interesting because this was a place where ag industry and environmental community could come together on an issue and both, both support it. Um, so it, it really caught wind. It was, the legislation was passed and then COVID hit. And it was the WSDA and the Conservation Commission portions of the budget were, um, were passed, but the WSU portion of the budget was COVID vetoed. Uh, turns out that was essentially a mistake. They, they didn't realize that by COVID vetoing us, we didn't have anything after the proviso period. Um, so coming back around in the next session, WSU was really going to move on because we were more worried about university level budgets, but WSDA basically resubmitted the request on behalf of WSU to move forward with the full initiative and it was funded. Um, so with that, um, we're, we're moving forward. Chris can talk in detail about what the initiative looks like, but I think the, the really important thing is our role as WSU in this really is the integration of research and extension in production systems and regions across the state, really towards not just the discovery and publications, but actually towards implementation of improved soil health management practices in the state. So with that, I will turn it to Chris. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Chad. Um, I'm gonna hop to a PowerPoint um, to sort of navigate through this uh, and, um, Karen, does that look all right to you? They're good. Cool. Okay. Um, so, uh, Chad sort of walked through what sort of occurred um, legislatively, but also sort of behind the scenes. I'm going to touch a little, I'm going to hit some of that more. Um, so, that whole thing of hearing things more than once will hopefully uh, send you home with a clear message. But um, the, this effort is called the Washington State Soil Health Initiative, and we call it WASHI by short. Um, that's to avoid confusion with the Soil Health Institute, which was uh, the SHI reference or acronym was, was common at the early stages of this. And we, as, as the, they are our partners, we don't want to confuse people. Um, and I want to point out that I'm speaking on behalf of th uh, two other people. Uh, Allison Helpern, who's at the Concert State Conservation Commission, and Danny Gillardi, who's at the State uh, Department of Ag. Um, this presentation we've amalgamated over time, um, uh, and it's a it's a group effort. Um, so, and I'll point out also that Deirdre Griffin with Hugh contributed to this as well. So, um, let's get into it. Um, so. Chad sort of walked through that, but I really want to emphasize how large this is. This is a really big deal, this initiative, when it, um, even in its early stages and most recently when it was technically fully funded, um, it was a really a paradigm shift um, that Washington State um, made virtually overnight in soil health research, extension, and incentive programs. Um, and the design is really crucial. I'll talk about that in a, a second. But again, overnight, it, it placed Washington State as one of the preeminent leaders of state-supported uh, soil health um, support um, in the country. 
Uh, and I'm going to talk about the roadmap later, but there's a, a nice uh, plug right now for that. Uh, within that roadmap, there's multiple pages that um, show sort of the, what other states have done for initiatives related to solo health, and they're all over the place. Um, but I think I, I could sort of make the argument that nothing is as none of the initiatives are as holistic or sort of forward thinking as as Washington states. Um, and it really utilized existing capacity, but it also uh, invested uh, to increase capacity through hires and, and research investment. Um, and it, it, I'll mention this later, it created uh, some of the largest density of long-term soil health research sites in the state, if not in the world. Um, and I'll get more into that uh, a little bit later. Um, and as Chad mentioned, it's a tri-agency effort. Um, the State Conservation Commission, uh, the Department of Ag and WSU, and we sort of each have our respective bins of responsibility. Um, the Conservation Commission is there for technical support, and they are they man, uh, manage an incentive program that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, WSDA is they are responsible for tracking and demonstrating progress, and this relates to that state of the soils uh, that I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but they're also there to sort of help with regulatory uh, navigation. Um, and they are technically the lead um, of all the agencies. Um, uh, but in WSU, uh, we sort of were given a set of instructions out of the gate, and then it was sort of a bigger picture. Uh, and I'll get into this in a little bit. Um, but uh, largely that was to develop a soil health roadmap initially to drive research and information dissemination, as well as manage these long-term long -term research sites. Um, and so Chad mentioned this earlier, uh, but I, 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 this presentation is somewhat um, uh, temporal in that I'll sort of walk through the last few years, um, sort of owning up to Karen's title that she applied to uh, this webinar. Um, so we'll start with looking back at 2019. Um, that's when the initial proviso funding came in. Um, proviso funding has is defined in, in both um, scope and time. Um, and so uh, for, for WSU specifically, our, our instructions out of the gate were, that, were these three. Initiated WSU's portion of the, of the initiative, Two, to develop a soil health roadmap um, that will guide both public and private investment. Um, and then third, and very specifically, was to establish a Mount Vernon uh, long-term soil health site at Mount Vernon. Um, this was less, it was a portion of the money that was originally requested in those fiscal notes that Chad referred to. Um, and so we sort of had to navigate that. Um, at this stage, I was asked to inter be the interim lead for it um, to sort of get us through this proviso period. Uh, little did we know what sort of a roller coaster this would become over the next uh, 18 to 24 months, um, but I'll talk about that. So I'm gonna sort of walk through some of the major efforts that the, that the initiative is focused on. Um, and I really am not doing justice because of just time limitations, but also your ability to concentrate for, on the subject matter for too, for too long. So let's get into the, the, the first one. And that's gonna look at um, the soil health roadmap. Um, if those that are interested, uh, and I'll provide a link in the chat as we move forward. Um, Karen did circulate that as part of the, uh, I believe the Outlook calendar um, invite, but you can also take an image, or pull up your phone and get a link to it right here. Um, this was uh, again, sort of directed to us in the first, um, in the first proviso funding, which is good because this sort of outlines sort of where we need to go. Um, and <clears throat> so in, it, in, in all, it took about, uh, about two years to develop. Um, it's about a 125 page document um, and I'm, I'll just hop into it um, to, to, to get into it. So to simplify this process of trying to break the very diverse state in both the state of Washington's very diverse production systems, but also its its uh, you know environments, its soils, etc. What we decided to do is sort of break the state into sort of focus areas. Um, part of this was driven by interest from from industry, and particularly in this example, the Columbia Basin potatoes. 
Um, the potato industry was a strong supporter at, at the outset and uh, are to uh, to this day. Um, so much so that they, that that eventually led to an endowment of a of a, a soil health uh, chair in the crop and soil science department. Um, so I'm going to walk through these these maps represent sort of general overviews of these focus areas. Um, they're not completely inclusive, uh, and and I will point out that WSD provided these for me. So the Columbia Basin, which is kind of in our south central portion of our state, um, we specifically called out potatoes because again because of their interest but also because of the importance in rotation that they play in this region. Um, the next is the general lean and a larger footprint, same footprint, but larger cropping diversity is the irrigated Columbia Basin. Um, this is a very interesting area. Uh, it represents a lot of high value uh, crops, um, but it also is kind of unique in that it, it wholly relies on irrigation for production. Um, and so in our, to our third area, this is the dryland. This is our biggest footprint. Um, and uh, this is also a very important industry, set of industries and uh, has some very unique issues that I'll talk about here in, in a minute. One group that's sort of technically is statewide, but maybe more regional is the environmental constituent. Um, one thing that I failed to mention, but Chad sort of roughed over was that this initiative is sort of a, a, an interesting situation where we can bring together agric the agricultural community alongside the environmental community and the public, and they can all benefit from the work that's being done by the initiative. And these are groups that don't always see eye to eye on things, but under this particular um, topic, subject matter, it, it does provide some uni uni unity. Um, and so uh, the environmental constituent, um, and I'll get to into the nitty gritty details of how we did this and what sort of the results are here in just a second. Um, the juice and wine group industry. Now this map, um, it does show the, the Puget Sound region and these are the AVAs um, in addition to the larger uh, planting area. But 99.9% .9 of the juice and wine grape production occurs in Eastern Washington. And so that's where this conversation occurred. <clears throat> and then uh, Northwest Washington annual cropping systems. Um, this was largely driven by that, that impetus that we got during the proviso funding um, in that, that there needed to be a, a long-term research site at, at Mount Vernon. Um, and I'll get to this later, but I'll mention it right now that there is a direct connection to a certain extent to the area, the focal areas and these long-term research sites because they are meant to feed into each other. <clears throat> and then our seventh is the tree fruit industry, um, largely dominated in the middle of the state. And then lastly is sort of a catch-all group, uh, which is the diversified farming systems in Western Washington. And for those of you that work in this area, as I do, you know that they do not all look like the, like the same, but we tried to get a general sense of of needs in this area that would be outside of that Northwestern Washington annual cropping system. So let's talk about process here, right? Because I think this is, uh, for those of you that have ever done this sort of large lift of trying to aggregate information, it's really important to know how we did it. Um, and so the next several slides sort of walk through that. But once we identified these focal areas, we um, identified a primary author um, for that focal area. And for the most part, those are WSU people. And for the most part, those are WSU extension that have extension appointments. Um, we, uh, the editors, Karen Hills and myself, provided an outline template. Um, this was sort of a, a framework for these authors to sort of fill in information. Um, and I'll explain what that looked like here in a second. Um, and then the that primary author identified existing information resources that are out there, whether it's printed or not, and then identified gaps. Um, and that, uh, that, that gap uh, sort of prioritized what efforts needed to take shape at that point. Um, and then at, at this stage, additional supplemental activities occurred. Now, what is that? Well, each focus area sort of took a different tact in that regard. Um, and some it was sitting down with growers, some it was sitting down with industry representatives. Um, it, it varied by region. Uh, we sort of let that organically happen at the, at the focus area level. Um, then key themes were extracted. 
Um, and the editors provided feedback at this stage and um, the primary authors sort of work through that. <clears throat> and I just wanna point out that there's a large group of people that contributed to this. Um, it's, a, it's a very lengthy document and I would like to think that it um, was very thorough as well. Um, but I wanna point out uh, Karen Hills and myself were the primary editors. These primary co contributors, these are the primary authors that I referred to in the previous slide. Um, I will say that I was very impressed when I requested th them to sort of participate in this. It was um, unpredicted and they all sort of stood up and, and said, yes, we can help out with this. Um, but there were other uh, contributors I wanna point out um, that, that played a role in, in making the roadmap uh, sort of come to reality. So let's look at the timeline of the process. As I mentioned, we started this in the fall of 2019. Um, and by uh, the, about, about a year later, we were pretty well along um, having some of the feedback from the primary authors. Um, we, uh, we reviewed it internally and had some uh, external partners, particularly at the um, our, our agency partners within the initiative. And um, this was then sort of finalized um, late last fall, I think it was in October technically, and we published it and made it available to the public. Now, what's really important is that this document just doesn't stop here, is that it is, it is a living document that will be updated over time. As you know, part of the, one of the components in it is we outlined issues, key problems. Um, we also asked, um, you know, what are, what are clear milestones or goals and um, you know, where do we want to see investments occur uh, that are relevant for that particular focus area? And so as we sort of progress through this um, and we reach certain goals or we want to set new milestones, um, we have to update this document. And so that's why you know, we sort of look at it as a, a, a non-living uh, document. And what's the purpose of this? Well, what it is is try to aggregate this information uh, for people and users. But um, really a good, and most recently, a good portion of it has been utilized to develop those long-term research sites that I'll talk about here in a second. Um, but also it's where we sort of, within the initiative saw opportunities to allocate resources. Um, and um, we're starting to see this play out outside of the initial scope um, right now, um, but also how to develop policy um, at, the state, at the state level. Um, and then lastly is to in, in provide input into research activities that, that, that might be occurring outside of those long-term sites that are supported by the initiative. So what I'm gonna get through now is I'm gonna sort of really cut through sort of some themes that we saw at each one of these focus areas. This is by no stretch of the imagination, a thorough sort of overview. Um, I just sort of wanna give people a sense of what sort of themes that we, that we uh, found. So let's start with the irrigated Columbia Basin. And for purposes of today, I've lumped the potatoes with the, the general uh, Columbia Basin. Um, this was led by Andy McGuire. Um, and uh, the, the primary process of information acquisition was an electronic survey. We actually got really good response rates. And, and frankly, people took the time to fill it out because it was a fairly thorough um, survey. Um, but some of the issues that, uh, for those of you that um, know this area is erosion, water holding capacity, soil borne diseases are the main issues. Some of the goals that, 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 this, that this area sort of um, is to try to increase adoption of soil health practices, try to increase that soil water holding capacity because it's such a, it's so important for this region. And then try to lower the cost of soil health practices. This is where maybe incentive programs might play a role. Um, and then where are our future, where should future research activities sort of prioritize themselves related to soil health is really the strategies to improve soil health, the economics, um, this is a common theme, and of course the benefits that soil health bring about. Now let's take a look at the dryland ag ag agriculture in Eastern Washington. This is a vast area. Um, this, the primary author in this area was Rich Koning. Um, and uh, he relied largely on existing assessments uh, that had occurred um, through a variety of different avenues. And it, you know, we'll start to see similar issues here. Erosion, pH becomes a, a, big, a, a, a common theme in this, in this region, um, as most that work in that area know. 
And sort of what are some of the goals in this region, in this focus area? And that largely has to do with adoption of soil health practices sort of become automatic, um, which, uh, you know, is, is, is not easy to do. Um, erosion, sort of redu redu reduction in erosion problems, and then the link economics to soil health practices. Where should research be prioritized? One is to, to look at long-term scope, which is of course a core component of the initiative, and then it should also be on farm. Uh, and this, this fact will show up later on in one of the other focus areas, but also that there needs to be regional best management practices, not to say that these don't currently exist, but people may not be cognizant of them. That's um, another common theme. Then we talked to uh, the environmental constituent, uh, Chad Kruger largely left this, led, led this. And we, um, and I should mention that most of this happened as sort of COVID broke out. And so we had this unique situation where we couldn't get people in the room together, um, but people were getting increasingly comfort with Zoom. And so it actually <laughs> provided us a, a, an opportunity in some regards to get more people involved. Uh, we had a listening session with this group. Um, it was a really good conversation. Uh, some key themes here are, are interesting because again, this group doesn't necessarily always see eye to eye with the, with the agricultural community, uh, but they wanna see these issues connected with resiliency um, and that, that they value or they prioritize the goals of increased knowledge of soil health and soil health practices, but also to make this information more accessible and that there needs to be financial incentives uh, to push push forward you know, for the state. And lastly, where does research need to occur or uh, pri be prioritized? Largely, this is related to carbon and carbon storage and carbon sequestration, um, but also water management. And then link, trying to evaluate the linkage between soil health and food nutrition, which is a complicated um, issue that actually was discussed in the, in the, in the roadmap itself. Juice and wine grapes, another <clears throat> a perennial production system. I think that's the first one we really got to at this point. Um, feedback was sought from individual growers and, and uh, existing resources was utilized. Uh, this was led by Gwen Ho Heisel and Michelle Moyer with contributions from a lot more people than that. What are the issues that sort of surfaced here? Nutrient cycling is a, is a, is a big deal, um, particularly, and I will point out that there was a, a, a very, big division between these two, the juice and the wine industry, because they they really um, sort of manage things almost on a polar opposite, uh, uh, sort of, particularly from a nutrient perspective, but also soil-borne pest um, diseases, uh, as we've seen in other areas. And their goals are largely to, to focus in on nutrient uptake, but also water management um, and uh, soil-borne uh, pest management. And where did this focus area sort of see priorities to invest research. Um, they want to see strategies to improve um, the benefits, the monitoring, the economics of soil health. Uh, and there's, you know, particularly in the wine industry, there's a, there, there could be uh, a, a, an easier marketplace valuation. And Northwest Washington annual cropping systems. Um, this was led by uh, uh, Gabe LaHue and Deirdre Griffin LaHue. Um, and because of timing, this occurred in December 20. 19, um, there was uh, actually an in-person listening session uh, with producers and consultants. Um, and if, for those that know this area, this is largely focused in on the Skagit uh, River Valley, um, but it does represent some issues to the north and to the south. Uh, but compaction um, being a major issue, uh, sort of resulting from the amount of intensive tillage that's driven by the rotation um, that's common in that area. Soilborne pathogens are uh, big issues. So, and what are sort of the things to overcome? Well, those physical and biological issues that, that, that are outlined here above. Where does area need to be reinvested in research? Um, benefits of lengthening crop rotation, particularly as it relates to economics, um, and how to optimize cover crop management. And again, these are just sheer summaries. There is a lot more detail that's, that's present in the, in the roadmap. And then tree fruit, a uh, big high value horticultural industry. Um, this was uh, 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 
the primary author on this was Tiana Dupont, um, and feedback was sought via in-person online surveys and focus groups. Tiana had done some previous work on this, so there were some existing resources uh, that she had led. Uh, fruit quality um, is a big issue as it relates to plant nutrition, plant, uh, soil-borne plant uh, diseases, and soil compaction were some of the named issues. What are some of the goals to sort of overcome these soil-borne disease incidences? And this has been a key priority for this industry for a long time, um, and they've invested heavily into that. Uh, and to just generally increase knowledge of soil health, you know, what is the definition? And so that we're all talking the same language. And then lastly, is to, to invest research into areas on replant disease, um, particularly as it relates to soil biology and how to analyze um, soil health across um, the tree fruit production zones. Our last area of focus is Western Washington. Again, this is a very diverse group um, and we're sort of applying a large footprint on this. Um, but these issues were very different. Um, and so I should point out that we held uh, listening sessions. Uh, Doug Collins led this effort um, uh, with 16 different farms across nine counties. Uh, and these issues, again, are very different than we saw in some of the other produ production areas. Um, land use changes are, are a big issue. Uh, the complexity of these systems, they're very diverse, both in, you know, in space and time and genetics, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, issues with soil fertility and soil borne pests, but also issue, uh, situations where fields are flooded. Um, and this partially has to do, in, in some cases, has to do with urban encroachment. What are some of the goals? Well, um, and these are in some ways less linked to the issues, which was kind of interesting, uh, but the improved technical support capacity, several mentioned that they've lost that locally. Um, and so that's something that could be, uh, could be set as a goal, uh, but also to increase resources for, um, for soil health practices for growers um, to, to try themselves and to, to try to adopt. So that incentive, you know, that carrot needs to be there for, um, what else? So where are the primary areas of interest for research? Uh, organic reduced tillage, um, soil biology and, and cover crops. So there were some overall sort of key themes and, um, you know, we, we spend, a, I think a few pages talking about this in the roadmap, but I sort of extracted some, some here. Um, and, and, and uh, so, Sort of going through this, one is, is that the value of soil health is very different across production systems, um, which one could assume, but was, was heavily emphasized. And this really underscores sort of a need for a diverse yet integrated approach to sort of uh, address these, these very big issues. Um, and one thing that was common across the state is that resources are need to be made for available to farmers to try these soil health practices, to try and reduce that risk. Some major issues is that the, all three pillars of soil health, biological, physical, and chemi chemical were mentioned, um, and, uh, and that that was not um, unique to one region or, or the other. Um, goals is to try to standardize the measurement. This is uh, an issue that's happening at the, at the global level, um, particularly as we start to talk about um, certain metrics related to carbon, um, that the ability to measure it needs to be easily deployed, inexpensive, and uh, which is sort of a high bar to be set for all three of those, um, but also the, that we need to Im improve basic knowledge of soil health, uh, to, to particularly the landowners and that we need to drive the marketplace to value this. And this is happening sort of behind the scenes, or if, if you're paying attention to it, it's not, but it is, uh, it is happening. Um, and one of the main things is to protect and increase soil organic matter, particularly east of the Cascades. Um, and we need to work and push forward to make sure that the general public understands and values um, soils. Where do we need to invest our research and outreach activities? One is understanding of soil biology. A lot of people mention sort of this black box, um, which is commonly referred to. Um, and how does soil health and food quality relate? Well, um, the, the literature is sort of uh, a suspect of that, um, but that again, that is addressed in the, in the roadmap. And then thirdly is to translate um, current knowledge 
into practices that some of the respondents felt that there was this gap that that exists between those two worlds. Um, and and lastly, I'll mention is is the return on investment of soil health practices economics. How does that fit into this overall uh, picture here? So I'm going to switch gears. That's the roadmap. I'm going to move into the state of soils assessment. Um, the underlying goal here is to develop a baseline understanding and to track soil health over time. Again, if we don't know where we're at and where we, we, we go to, we don't know how we're doing. And so that's what this, this effort. And this is a collaboration between WSDA and WSU. Um, and as I mentioned, WSDA is the primary lead, lead on this um, in terms of uh, assess, uh, maintaining that assessment. So um, the goal here is really, you know, how healthy are our soils and our systems and that that there are different limitations and challenges in each system and particularly in the state, you know, that has such a variation in rainfall and soil types and textures that, that these are very different, but also we have an incredibly diverse uh, agricultural production systems in the state. <clears throat> so, and so how do we define soil health for Washington soils and systems? Um, WSU was awarded a specialty crop block grant in collaboration with WSDA to try to address this. And so uh, the, the effort here was to establish a baseline data set of current soil health status in major specialty crop systems um, and key soil challenges within those systems. That would then contribute to a database to develop scoring curves for soil health measurements in the Pacific Northwest soils and the systems. And then thirdly is to evaluate how soil management practices influence these soil health metrics. So take home message here in this effort is track soil health over time, develop a baseline understanding, develop these scoring curves, which are increasingly becoming uh, popular and to develop that, uh, to maintain and uh, contribute to that database. So over since 2020, um, uh, over 302 sa uh, sites were sampled with support from that, that specialty crop block grant. With efforts by WSDA, that number is actually north of about 400. Um, and you can see these are these um, uh, <clears throat> these dots represent individual sample fields. And you can see here um, the diversity of the different cropping systems. Um, and they range largely all over the state um, with some exceptions in sort of the Southwestern uh, region. Um, and you can see that, uh, that there's a, in the case of potatoes, there's a good balance between Eastern and Western Washington, almost a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and again, these were uh, a variety of different soil health um, assessments were, 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 um, were done on, on these samples. So how was this sampling actually done? Some of you may be curious about this. And the way that it worked was um, uh, Deirdre Griffin who led this component um, is that fields were, were sampled or paired. One with higher soil health or so, uh, that the grower considered to be higher soil health practices or that they were, they were uh, enrolling in soil health building practices and one that would be the opposite within the same farm. And um, in this example here, you can see that there there are two different fields here, um, one that has, you know, has initiated soil health building practice and one that not. And this 97 is where that, that sampling occurred within that field to sort of uh, mitigate variation within a given field. Um, and there were 50, 50 points within each field that, that were sampled. Um, now, I'm not going to get into this a lot because we just don't have the time, but um, also because Deirdre is the one that, to talk to about this. So if you're interested, you can contact her, um, I provide her contact information. But they, they also, as part of this effort, um, they, they, they acquired metadata to sort of get a sense of, um, you know, what is the rotational history within that field? What are the tillage practices, the irrigation? Have there been any amendments, um, you know, made within the, you know, within the past? And what are those challenges, those priorities, that, the issues that, that that grower is running into? And then of course, yield. Um, and this, um, this effort is moving forward. Um, and actually there's a student working on his, his dissertation related to this. So I'm gonna switch gears sort of 
fast forwarding, I you know sort of talked about 2019, 20, um, and Chad uh, talked about um, that first round of funding, which was two years um, in that under that proviso, um, was coming to term, and we sort of needed to know what we we needed to prioritize, invest in, and so over the course of the winter of um, 2020 into uh, 2021. Um, as Chad has mentioned, in, in, in 2020, it was it was the the full funding was was on the governor's desk to be signed, and uh, because of COVID was was uh, set to the back. But um, in 2021, uh, the the full funding for WSU was looking like it was going to be moving forward, which would have brought us into our current fiscal year. Uh, Additionally, in 2021, the Washington Sustainable Farms and Fields Program uh, was um, was uh, was funded. Um, I'll get more into that in a second, um, but it was looking very promising for the initiative at the, at, at this stage, and that brought us to um, the point where we are starting to talk about our the uh, long-term agroecological research and extension sites or LTERs. Um, this is. For WSU, this is our core activity. Um, this is where we invest the vast majority of the funds that are allocated annually um, to WSU. And um, you know, it addresses this major issue that most uh, soil scientists have is, is that funding cycles are too short to really take a make sense of, of what, what, it, what can happen or change in soils, because those changes typically take a long time. And that is sort of a perennial issue for soil scientists, particularly as it relates to soil health. So um, this sort of investment that, that, uh, that Washington has made into these long-term sites has really, as I mentioned earlier, thrusted w, uh, Washington forward in terms of sort of leading uh, soil health research efforts. Um, and one of the things that's that's interesting, and I'm gonna get into the details of where the elters are, but the goal here is to fund these in perpetuity, that these sites would be funded essentially forever, um, which offers in of itself a really, really unique opportunity. This is actually an image of, um, this was from 2021, of uh, the WSU Mount Vernon site, um, which uh, is just a reminder, it was specifically called out in that initial two-year proviso funding to get started. And so that, that effort has been underway for over two years now. So stepping back a little bit, for those that are unaware, um, USDA ARS has a network of LTARs, uh, there's no E on the end of them, uh, that are present across the US. Um, and you know, this makes, you know, the US is very lucky to have this network. And you can see they, they, this is the sites across the US and they represent large geographic regions. The closest one to us is the Cook Agronomy Farm, um, which is um, in, outside of Pullman. And um, the, you know, if you are interested in this, the, this uh, there's the link to, 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 to getting to it. But these, these are not all agricultural. Um, they are agroecological or ecological in, in basis uh, and are very diverse in what they look like. Uh, for example, the Kellogg Biological Station, they grow row crops there, but they also have a short-term woody um, uh, component, uh, which, is, which is quite interesting. And um, so with more information, check that out. But as the, as the initiative in Washington State was developed, this network was very attractive and, and sort of something that wanted to be emulated. And so that's where that initial design of WC managing these long-term sites came into play. Late last fall, or excuse me, last fall, um, after we, we were aware that we secured funded, we sought out a request for qualifications to add additional sites to the w, to the Mount Vernon site. And um, we asked several things, but one of some of which included that they need to re represent major cropping systems and that they, the design of them um, need to be pr provided from input from advisory groups and they have to be located on WC property. Idea there is if we're gonna make long-term investments, we need to secure the fact that that land's gonna be there um, uh, in, you know, in, for length. So after that call, submissions were made and a group of um, internal and external uh, peer reviewers um, 
uh, went through and, and identified that and prioritized or provided suggested to fund three additional sites. Um, and those I'm going to sort of walk, I'm going to walk through all four of them, sort of give some detail. Um, the first I'll talk about is the diversified Western Washington uh, site that's going to occur at uh, WCU Puyallup. Um, that's led by Doug Collins, but also Stephen Bramwell, Todd Murray, and uh, Marin Friesen. And um, I want to point out that this, this research site is supposed is going to try to represent a lot of the diversified organic ag in Western Washington. Um, and it's going to include a, a livestock, an integrated livestock component, but also reduced tillage. Second site I'll talk about, um, this again began in 2019 as required by the proviso. Um, this is led, led by um, Gabe LeHue and Deirdre Griffin LeHue. It occurs at Northwestern Washington Research Center in Mount Vernon. Um, and this uh, is the only currently operating experiment, um, but it relies on residue management as treatments but also as external organic matter inputs. And it is focused in on fresh market potatoes that drive the economics in that, in that region. The third one that, that will be getting, that is funded is the tree fruit um, that's occurring in Wenatchee. That, this is led by Tiana Dupont. Um, some of the treatments that are included there are uh, mulches um, it, in addition to uh, external organic in, uh, matter inputs, um, an organic specific treatment and a uh, treatment that, that tries to address replant uh, issues. And the fourth is wine grapes at, um, in Prosser. Um, this is led by Devin Rippner, Michelle Moyer, um, Marcus Keller, and Troy Peters. Um, and some of the treatments that, that, are, uh, that are, are taking shape in here um, is mowing of alleyways and sort of redirecting that into the, the in-row uh, cover crops and, and external uh, organic matter inputs. So these are the... Um, the four, the, the four sites that are that are sort of coming online this year. And I do want to point out that you, as I mentioned on that first map, that WS, USDA, excuse me, USDA um, is and has been operating uh, a research site at the dryland um, at Cook Agronomy, Agronomy Farm. Um, I would say in the next year, we're hoping to bring on two more additional sites. Um, one that's going to be represent the irrigated Columbia Basin. Um, we're sort of waiting for the endowed chair to, to, to come online for that, but I'm, and I'm also hopeful that we can get an additional dryland site um, that uh, that uh, would represent uh, the dryland region. So I will um, sort of briefly mention the Sustainable Farms and Fields Program. Um, this is the incentive arm to try to drive adoption of soil health practices at at the at the landowner level. Um, this is administered by the State Conservation Commission. When the legislature passed, this is a separate act um, than the um, separate legislation than what funded uh, WSDA and WSU. And it provided funds to initiate the program, but it did not provide funds to, for the actual incentive portion of it. It is looking promising that that might change going forward. Um, and uh, there are additional efforts to try to secure uh, uh, other funds outside of the state of Washington to try to um, push this program forward. Okay, so what is the what is the scope of this? This is a grant program for landowners uh, focused on practices that increase carbon sequestration in both vegetation and soil um, to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and anything that leads to improving in soil health. Some examples of grants would be, um, you know, sharing the cost of climate uh, smart practices or projects, uh, purchasing, you know, shared equipment that could help with that, like a no-till planter. Um, and I think uh, it's very hopeful that, that this program is going to get funded going forward. I do want to point out, um, you know, we talked about sort of the three agencies that are involved in this, but there are several other key collaborators that stepped up to try to uh, emphasize to get this the initiative fund, funded, but also to move it forward uh, going forward. So I just want to point, point them out. And um, we've got about uh, eight minutes left. I wanted to leave a little bit of time for, for questions and I'll just leave, leave up the uh, contact information um, for the three um, agencies if, if, if folks are interested in that. 